Hi guys, Stuart Thomas from Warrior Collective, back uh, for another episode of Inside Chat. And this one's a little bit different. As you can see, uh, we're not on Instagram Live anymore. I'm here in my new studio, very swanky, very posh. Uh, I hope you like it. Uh, now today I'm joined by Matt Lovell. Uh, he's a phenomenal nutrition expert from the UK. Now I've known Matt for uh, quite a long time now. Um, and I'm really stoked to have him on and I'm sure this is going to be the first of many times to have him on because there's no way I can pick his brains in, in just one simple talk. So Matt, how are you? Thanks for having me on Stu. It's, it's amazing to be in this new swanky studio remotely and catching up. It's always good. So Matt, obviously, uh, like I've just said, I've, I've known you for quite a long time now, but for people who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about your background? And so what your nutrition company is Amino Man, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I, I run two companies. Uh, one, one is called Perform and Function Limited, and that's, that's my nutrition consultancy company, and that's been going for about 16 years now. And that's the the umbrella under which I sort of do all my consultancy work with teams, with athletes, with individuals. And then I've got um, Amino Man, which is more of a fledgling company, sort of just just getting started up. Really, that's been going for four or five years, uh, and that's that is how I manufacture aminos, plant based botanicals, and basically it's a supplementation company designed to enhance human performance on the back of you know solid a proper diet yeah so food food first is always the way forward and then you throw in some extra special sprinkles once everything's established so i guess for some people uh nutrition conjures up different it's different things for different people isn't it some people are going to uh, kind of go nutrition oh that's diet nutrition oh that's fueling performance for sport nutrition that's some kind of hippie things that other people do. How do you view nutrition then? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think fundamentally, you know, we are, we, we have, everyone has to eat. It's, you know, it's, it's number one survival priority. Um, boiling things back down to the, the simple stuff is something I always like to do. So yeah, eat well, sleep well, train well. So you can be as healthy as possible, and then in your chosen sport or activity, um, perform as as best you can. And I think it, that always starts with what we might call fundamentals. So you know, if you're thinking about, well, I've got, I I do eat, I have to eat to stay alive, but then what what should I eat in order to thrive and optimize my body composition and all that sort of stuff. So something that you might just do instinctively out of habit, out of ritual, out of how you've been brought up and taught to eat by the people around you. One of the first steps we sort of go into is picking that apart and saying, well, okay, keep do a food diary for me and then let's have a look at, you know, what is actually happening, what's going in and what, you know, what the net result of, of all those foods and drinks and everything else you're choosing to eat, what's the net result on your physiology, your body fat, your body weight, and all that sort of stuff? So, I mean, I know, um, obviously, I know that you kind of have a, a, a good a passion for fitness and martial arts. Um, what, how do you see nutrition then for people who train or, or martial arts and, and then potentially who go to that next level of, of competition, you know, and have to wait because martial arts is one of those sporting activities where weight's obviously a really big part of it once you go past a certain level. Um, obviously, back in the day, nutrition wasn't one of those things that people knew as much about and they did a lot of 
weight cutting through saunas, really big water cuts. And to, to be fair, even now, water cuts are still a part of uh, a lot of elite athletes kind of preparation mm. for a fight for the weigh-ins. Um, how do you, how do you educate, given that you come from that nutrition background and you know martial arts, uh, how do you help athletes prepare for, for, for those weight cuts and, and, and getting ready for the fights without feeling overly drained yet still making the, uh, appropriate weight they need to? Yeah. So <clears throat> a few, a few things in there. So the first thing that I would suggest is is all about macronutrients. So you, you can't assume that someone knows, you know, what is a protein, what is a carb, what is a fat and so on. So we, it would be educating people, you know, how many grams of protein should you eat for your lean body weight? What's the right amount of carbs to fuel your training so you're not running out of energy, but not so much that you're either not making weight or dropping fat effectively as part of your pre-fight preparation. So every fighter knows that, you know, any dead weight, so any excess body fat, unless you're in a sort of heavyweight division, is superfluous to needs and it's just dead weight. So the the better you're able to maximize your muscle and minimize your fat before you're actually thinking about making weight, the better competitive advantage you're going to have on paper. Um, and for me, that means st beginning with a template, which is what we started you on, which is the, I call it 211 magic macros. So you basically eat two grams of protein per kilo lean mass, one gram of carb, one gram of fat. So it effectively comes in if you if you cross reference that against something called basal metabolic rate those macros come in more or less exactly where all the basal metabolic rate equations come out as and basal metabolic rate means the just the minimum amount of calories you need to function breathe sleep just function normally so to give an example for me uh, sitting at say 85 kg i'll be coming in at somewhere between sort of 16 Hundred and seventeen hundred calories per day on a two one one uh, protein, fat, and carbs. Now, it's really important to emphasise that if you try and do that and train twice a day for an hour, you're going to run out of gas really quickly. Uh, so, once you've established your base, you would then look at fueling your training sessions with a percentage of the estimated calories you burn. I know we're going quite quickly into sort of detail and coaching, but you know, lots of people will hopefully find this useful. So let's just say you burn a thousand calories in high intensity pad, pad session for an hour. Um, you can then choose to fuel those thousand calories, either the full thousand with a pre and post or even intra workout nutritional drink shake uh, or you can choose if you're trying to make weight just to to meet that by 50 percent so you have your basal metabolic calories 211 and then for every hour you train high intensity you add in 500 calories from additional snacks and shakes and so on along the way and to know whether that equation is right for you because everybody's different the, one of the reasons you'll work with the, with a coach, uh, nutrition or strength and conditioning coach, is that they will be able to measure your body fat either weekly, bi-weekly. They'll know all your power output, all your strength sessions. So they'll be able to gauge very quickly whether that fuel mix is an, enough to allow you to adapt to the demands of your training, but also there's enough of a deficit if you're making weight that your your fat loss is nice and gradual. So you give yourself a good amount of time to make weight, you know, not not suddenly signing up for a fight and thinking, I've got to drop 10 kg in two weeks. Although I'll come to that in a minute. Because part of that sort of water loading and then depletion, it is a valid strategy for making 
wait as long as you've got enough time to rehydrate before you fight. I think I think the danger with massive water loss is, you know, you don't have enough time for everything to hydrate, particularly the fluid around the brain, and then obviously in the contact, any contact sport that opens you up to greater risk and ultimately whatever we do as a practitioner has to be centered around health first and then performance sort of comes in second so any kind of risk factors like that you just can't you can't get involved in because um, you've got to have the best interest of your your athlete or your client in mind yeah i mean you've just touched upon it there i mean obviously uh weight cutting is still done you know in in all kind of levels of combat sports what do you think then is an acceptable amount to be uh weight cutting through water when if you have like you said the day before weighing to recover what would kind of be the the formula that you would look for because as you know like some some fighters in the past have always typically had a bit of a blowout after a fight put a load of weight on and then have uh you know an uphill battle to 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 make weight for the next fight now obviously as Mm. people become more educated about nutrition more professional athletes in in modern sports have have been able to uh come away from that and maintain a a fairly decent walk around weight especially for fighting when fights might come up last minute uh, and you need to you know jump on that fight but what what do you think is the an acceptable you know kind of formula amount for for weight cutting through through obviously water cuts well um it's it, it it's a great question and i think that phrase you use walk around weight is a really good one so let's say you let's say you got a fight at 70 but you're walking around at 80 that's too much i in my opinion because you know going beyond 5% dehydration is going to you know seriously compromise your uh, effectiveness and health even though you can you can do that if you've got 24 hours to rehydrate afterwards so my my personal um, sort of advice around where fighters should walk around at would be about um, around about 10% over their the weight they've got to make in order to fight so but it, it may be a little bit more maybe 12% so let's say you need to fight at 70 and you weigh I, I think it'd be reasonable to weigh 80 at a walk around weight however what I would suggest is that means that you you really need a six week window in order to get lose the fat down to 75 and this is all that average sort of advice that I've you know given over the years. It can be different for different people. So you so you you've got to fight at seventy. You're walking around at eighty. You've got six to eight weeks to diet down. So you know you can lose the fat. You can, you can drop. You can safely drop a kilo of fat a week in an intensive fight camp. So that might bring you down to say seventy four, seventy five. Now. Everyone knows one of the classic tricks to make weight <clears throat> is hot bath, heavy heavy towel, heavy robes, jump, you know, go to bed. And actually, even if you don't have a hot bath, you'll find that the weight that you jump on the scales at before you go to bed, you'll probably be down one and a half to two kg overnight without without this hot bath and sauna suit or hot bath and hot robe. So you've got two kg you can do there instantly, and then you by by cutting carbs, um, water loading for a few days before. Basically, water loading without going into too much details. When you drink a lot of water with salt, so you increase the turnover of fluids, and then you drop all the water and all the salt out. So then your body expels. A lot of fluids so you get an artificial decrease in your body's water weight and it's a it's an effective method to make weight and also it's a very effective uh, method for looking 
very dry, very lean, very shredded for sort of photo shoots. Obviously, fighters not bothered about, you know, they want to look good, but it's not a photo shoot. They're, they're there to, you know, for a different job. So really the water loading in that instance is just so that they can make weight. And the, the difference, you know, I've looked after fighters whose coaches have got the philosophy that actually you should fight quite close to the weight uh, that you're, that you're going to make. So you might be walking around only two to three kilos over your fight weight. And, you know, with, with respect for anyone's philosophy, that is one way you can do it. But if you look at a fighter that does that as a method versus a fighter that does the water cut, then you can be looking at two fighters getting in that look as if they're maybe two weight categories apart. And the fighter that's done, say, a 10 kg water cut, and when they rehydrated and carb back up, you know, they can, they can, it can almost be like a David and Goliath type situation in the ring. You, you know, you know, I've seen that happen in um, many professional fights. So, I think it is worth identifying a safe and effective cutting strategy which could be up to t up to um, five or six percent over your uh, of your body weight that you can lose in the in the cut in the few days leading into the weigh-in day yeah i mean i i agree completely i mean i've been around enough fighters at high level events uh on the on the weight cuts uh with the baths and the hot towels etc um but I mean, not like, like this is an example as well. Like one championship, they've introduced the hydration test now to go alongside the weight cut. So I mean, I've seen a few, you know, really experienced fighters who've been uh, caught out by having to do both because it's a fine line, isn't it? You know, having a hydration test and a weight cut. And obviously, one championship introduced it as a way to stop people cutting too much weight. Um, and then obviously some promotions don't have that hydration test. Uh, what what do you think of the the hydration test alongside the the weight cut then? Um, well, clearly that's going to tell you whether someone's severely dehydrated or not in order to make weight. So uh, I think it all really depends on how long you've got to hydrate before you fight. So that with with safe with the fighter safety in mind. First of all, if you've only got a few hours until you fight and you're you're making weight by being severely dehydrated, it's clearly a number of risks uh, for brain health because there's less fluid around the brain to protect the brain when you get, say, a concussion injury. So that that's the reason they're doing it. So, now, so are you are you, a, are you a, a kind of advocate of that? Then would you would you think that other promotions should follow suit uh, and, and and use that as a way to kind of off the the big weight cuts you sometimes see in in some fights. Well, do you know what I think? Probably, probably it it is it does highlight safety first. But if you're dehydrated and you've got twenty four hours to hydrate before you fight, then that does I don't think that matters as much. I think perhaps um, maybe a more prudent use of. Uh, urine testing might be to look for diuretic use because obviously once you start sticking um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical diuretics into the picture that's when you can get severe levels of dehydration I suppose the urine test is an end point to that but you could just look for yeah commonly used pharmaceutical diuretics with the urine test I mean that Anytime you're using drugs, and I know they're banned and things like that, but anytime you're using those drugs to make weight, which obviously is com pretty common practice still, uh, you, you're exposing yourself to more severe levels of dehydration and then you're increasing the risk. So, I mean, now that we've, we've kind of talked us through that then, um, and having been around, you know, a lot of athletes and fighters yourself, what are the... What are the stereotypical mistakes you see athletes making when it comes to nutrition and weight cutting then? Well, do you, one, one really key thing uh, 
which I always say again and again and again is never never try something leading into an event or competition that you haven't practiced in training first and yet you you, you know you still see really experienced athletes you know to, to say you, you you make your weight and then it's it's all about getting the carbs and the fluids back in and they look over and they're going like oh those electrolyte gels look good I might try a few of those and then you know smashing down the electrolytes and then you know suddenly you get a really upset stomach because it's not something you not something you've tried and tested in in your cutting preparation so, so sometimes what I suggest uh, is almost that they do a practice cut and reload a couple of weeks before and that can be you know just to get used to the whole things they don't need to go all the way down but just to get used to a bit of water loading bit of depletion making a, a set weight which might it's two weeks out so that might be two or three kilos over the weight they've actually got to make and then rehydrate nicely carb reload nicely and then they can get into their final week of fight preparation you know fully loaded with the with the knowledge and the sort of this the sense of confidence that the protocol works and then and then I'd suggest look if you're if you're fighting on foreign soil it's all you know it's all about preparation so you might have all your favorite things to reload on carbs in your bag but what if your bag doesn't make it through you know airport security so you, you need you need the same set of things that you use for any kind of event in your own kit bag and then you need a backup bag like a bag number two so so that you know if everything gets lost in transit you've still got your your tried and tested stuff ready to go <clears throat> so i mean i know you don't just work with uh, obviously athletes. So what what kind of services is it that you provide and what kind of range of people do you provide them to? Well, um, so I might, you know, I might work with, with um, film stars. Uh, one of my, one of my best friends and training partners is, is you know, is a Hollywood actor. Um, you can see you can see him after water cut and photo shoot. Some of his shots are on my website, so you can sort of see the type of level of low body fat you can get to, and the, the kind of look um, that you can achieve by that sort of water loading and dehydration strategy. And yeah, hand, right now, a handful of fighters, handful of footballers, um, a few track and field athletes, but actually. Whereas maybe five years ago I was eighty percent elite sports and twenty percent normal folk and other athletes, I'm probably eighty percent corporate now. So corporate programs, health in the workplace, you know the, the phrase corporate athlete. So you know these these are people that maybe they're just our average Joes. They might be into fitness and stuff, but they don't know necessarily how to look after themselves and yet they push themselves in the work arena just as hard as any athlete might do in um, on the track so it's, yeah it's looking after those types of people at the moment so what is it you actually do for them though what so what is it so obviously if someone's listening to this going god you know matt knows his stuff um what is it you offer to individuals or gyms or coaches or like you said uh you know, a um, a corporate individual who's who's just looking for fitness. So, what is it? What is it you you offer these people then? Yeah. So, so the process would be. I think. I think um, a phrase self awareness is really critical. So that means I need my client to be self aware, but I also need to know what's going on, you know, with them, and that means. That means having lots of conversations. So you you need to really learn how someone ticks. You need to learn their daily rituals, habits, and then you can you can back up all those conversations with um, with questionnaires, which will then tend to lean you down what you might do in terms of further investigations. So 
you know, bread and butter stuff would be, I need their height, I need their weight, I need their body fat, I need, so, and from that I can get their lean mass. I'll, I'll preferably have some wearable data, so daily movement, um, sleep patterns, duration, deep sleep, REM, that type of stuff. And then detailed food diary uh, and detailed training history, PBs. So all, all things that you can, all bits of information you can get without doing any invasive type tests. And then to, to back that up, I then want to look at bloods. So I want to know nutrient status, um, vitamin D, B vits, trace minerals. So I want to know all, I want to know how the body's working inside. You know, so standard biochemistry, liver function, all that sort of stuff. And then once once you kind of got that big download of all that data, it's then, I mean, I suppose part of the challenge and one of the wonderful things about being a coach is you're then into, you're into the coaching bit, which is all about how do you help someone change their behavior, change the way they're thinking about their approach to food, their approach to training. And that's that's one of the ongoing conversations that just makes the whole thing really rewarding and rich and and look you the, the key thing is you're listening as much as you possibly can and and doing as much as you can to help somebody improve i think and and i think that in a nutshell that's pretty much my approach and that's that those are the, those are the first steps i'll go through and then how long you coach someone for depends on how fast they can learn but typically Someone will be on, on board, if you like, from anywhere from two to six months. And in that time, they should know. In fact, within three months, they should know everything they need to know. Otherwise, I've not, I've not been teaching them fast enough or they've been, not been learning fast enough. And then from there, some people really enjoy the process, so they want the monthly contact. But otherwise, what I'll do is switch someone to maybe bi-monthly or a six month check in. So we'll do biannual bloods, review, and then reset them, reset them back up on a program. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, this brings me to the point that obviously you've, you've done loads of work with me, and I guess I'm a, I'm a bit of a case study for this. Uh, I know, uh, even though I asked you to just say that I know all those things that you, you, you kind of asked me. And what I found interesting. Um, from your work with me is obviously I've been around martial arts and fitness all my life, but as a now that I'm of a certain age, <laughs> over forty, um, and vegetarian, you know, leaning more towards vegan, I, I kind of didn't realize until we kind of spent more time together, um, kind of the mistakes I was making. Because again, I thought I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd a fairly okay handle on things, and but you know, when we first spoke. Uh, and then through that process of you getting the bloods taken, the hormone tests, you know, and so it was it was very interesting for me seeing that roadmap of my deficiencies. You know, obviously, as you know from my results, uh, my deficiencies with vitamin D um, and uh, other aspects of uh, my uh, makeup on, on that sense. And when I came to you, I was actually the, the heaviest that I've ever been. And I was, I think, 87 kilograms, which which is heavy for me. When I was younger and I was competing, you know, I never really competed. I used to compete anywhere between 70 and 74. And obviously, I'm a lot older now. But And I don't, and I still think I carried the weight okay and I was training okay. But I did feel, I was starting to feel my age, feeling like a bit of an injury-prone mm. uh, endemic. And through, the, you know, within three months, I'd gone from that 80, uh, 87 kilograms to... You know pretty much what I am now, which is between seventy seven and seventy eight which and without and that's without really kind of having done any excessive training because obviously we're in the middle of lockdown, so training's actually no longer as brilliant for me as it once was. That's really all been down to you and the nutrition and and the supplements that you've kind of advised me to have um so for me it's that was uh I, I guess i'm a, a real success story for for everything that you've just said then. Yeah, do you know what? A couple of things there. First of all is well done. 
because you've effectively, you know, you've dropped 10 kg of fat in three months. And I, I knew you'd do well because like a lot of, a lot of fighters and people with good discipline, when you saw the plan, you would, you would just be someone who would stick to the plan and, and follow and follow the rules. And that's one of the things is to trust the system, stick to the plan sort of 80% of the time is good for most people, 90% if you want a bit faster results. And you've, you know, you've reaped the rewards and we've yet to go into the next phase of your plan, which is into the performance phase. But obviously that, you know, we just need to wait until everything's back to normal and you're smashing pads and doing grappling and all that sort of fun stuff with your mates. Now, the, the other thing which was interesting for you and you know, you've touched on a couple of the things was you, with, with, the, with the, the benefit of doing the blood testing, we identified some holes in, in your, your previous dietary approach. You know, and I, I could look at the food diary, could run that through some software and we could see, you know, where you, you, know, where you were focusing on. Your diet was good. Look, anyone that would look at your old diet would say, yeah, that's pretty good. It's balanced. There's lots of different things going in there. You were eating as a very good vegetarian leaning towards vegan approach. But you'll remember that the ratios of your carbohydrate intake versus protein and so on was but basically putting a challenge on your physiology to allow it to lose the fat that you wanted to lose. So by tinkering with those macros and getting you close to the ratios that I, I we opened up with you know you that was it that's all you needed to do and then the, the fat literally just melted off you and then look the you, your ferritin was low so often um, when you cut out food groups from animals and and so on you you can open up some gaps which then you need to replace by sensible plant food choices but without knowing that your ferritin, so ferritin is stored iron, without knowing that was low, that was potentially leading to you feeling a bit uh, more fatigued than you would do otherwise. And omega-3 is often a little bit lacking in in that type of a diet as well, uh, with you know absence of oily fish, even with lots of vegetarian sources of omegas that are available. So I'm looking forward actually to your new phase. I know it won't be long until we can jump you up a level but yeah you 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 you've been you've been a model student and modern client a model client yeah no like like you said uh, i mean i i'm i've got to say i'm pretty i'm pretty obsessive me when i have a plan and i stuck to that that nutrition thing a hundred percent and you know and that that was the funny thing you know going back to the blood tests and the hormone tests the deficiencies i mean as i as, as i said to you when we first got together um, I was, tr I trained hard. This is a stupid thing. I've always trained hard. I've always pushed myself. And that's that, that thing I think that you get from martial arts and combat sports is intensity, you know, but I was struggling uh, with the intensity there that I'd never struggled with before. And, you know, people saying, oh, you're getting old. And I'm like, I'm not that old, you know? And so mm. I think dealing with the deficiencies as well with the supplements you gave me, coupled with losing the weight, um, massively improved my performance just even in the training that I'm doing now, which has been mainly on my own, obviously because of um, the lockdown and restrictions. But I can see the the difference, you know, I can see the development even in that. And, you know, I, I, you know I'm looking forward to, like I said, taking that to the next stage once, once the restrictions lift. Um, I, I guess for anyone watching or listening, I, that's what I think I've really taken away from this is obviously your education on the whole, you know, macronutrients and nutrients, but also about the holistic approach of, you know, looking at the whole, looking at the whole body, the deficiencies, and I suppose getting it all in sync. You know, that's what I've taken from my from from all the time that we've spent together on that, and I, you know, again, given my age and the fact that I'm on a vegetarian diet. Um, I don't think I'm on my own in that sense. I think a lot of people out there who are no longer athletes um, or and who are no longer maybe competitive combat sports athletes, they might be running marathons or they might be running to, to, to do personal PBs and in different things. I think this is this is maybe where 
like like with me guilty of maybe not placing that with the importance that it has you know uh, i've mm. got to say i definitely hold my hands up and like you said i thought i was doing okay with it and then realized given what we've done in the short space of time we were doing it kind of how uh how far away well not far away but how how wrong i was in in just concentrating on purely physical training and coaching whereas actually you know this aspect is is of equal if 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 not even more importance dare i say i certainly think it works yeah it is it's a synergy isn't it it's got to work hand in hand i mean i know lots there's lots of phrases banded about like you can't out train the poor diet and it's 80 percent diet 20 percent training i'm not really sure on what percent of what matters but i know that you need both to excel in performance you definitely do you definitely and i think you're right i think for 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 a lot of very good reasons plant-based uh, approach you know is probably the way forward and i'm i've always advocated 80 percent plants in in my approach and then but i don't necessarily put big filters i'll work I, I use what's called a flexible dieting approach so depending on what someone's ethics preferences and so on alike i just tailor it down if you want to be vegetarian you can be vegetarian if you want to be vegan you can be vegan hey if you want to do paleo we can work on you know just work on that and just adapt adapt it really to the client's needs but also inform them of the gaps and that's all that's all we did with you um but i'm i'm a big fan i think plant based has to come first cuz whatever you whatever you read vegetables just always they rock you know all all aspects of health are enhanced by high vegetable intake high intake of herbs spices all those things and then what you put on top where you choose to get your proteins after that is really up to you it might be a preference, might be ethical, might be planetary based, or a bit of all those things. But I, you know, I think mass farming. There's problems with mass farming. You know, I, I'm not sure it's always possible. But if you do eat animals, knowing where they come from is quite a good philosophy. Knowing how they've been raised, that that's been done in a nice, uh, a, a nice fashion, and animal husbandry that the, the animal's been you know, looked after and, and so on. I think all those things are really, really important. So for, um, what would, what would your, I guess, top tips or best advice be for, um, someone training, you know, let's say martial arts, cause that's been the topic today, uh, as a, as a hobbyist or as an athlete in terms of their approach to improving their nutrition. So like a few tips that they could improve their nutrition straight away. You know, just general ones, you know, that anyone could take advantage of. Well, I think some some of those tips would be um, not necessarily about where they're approaching their food from first, but one one very good tip would be to get you know get a set of scales that measure your body composition, get a tape measure. I've probably got a tape measure around here somewhere. So you can make, you know, you can measure your waist. You, you can do a, you can do a height to waist ratio. There's lots of equations on the internet that you can look at. So you can basically really have a, a proper look. Are you, are you carrying too much fat for your weight? Um, lots of people will be a normal weight, but over fat because they don't train the muscles enough or, or eat enough protein. And so uh, it's back to that self awareness. So as soon as you've as soon as you've got that bit of knowledge, you'll then know: Do I need to increase my my protein generally throughout my day? And lots of people do do need to do that. Uh, and the next thing that's most often uh, neglected is vegetable intake. So I I advocate nine to twelve servings a day. Um, leaning more towards veg than fruit so say nine veggies three fruit kind of kind of ratio keep the fruit around your training because it's it's got lots of quick energy it's easy to digest you know 
um, nibbling on a few grapes on the way down to the gym. You know, you often be fully fueled by the time you get there, and you have a you have a really good session. Um, and it's quite sh it's shocking, even even when you think you're taking a lot of veg, um, quite often you'll come up a little come up a little bit short. So. You, you can use software to start looking at where your macros are coming out yourself, so do a bit of self-analysis. Or you can just get an old-fashioned notebook and jot down a few meals and just have a little look. Um, a portion of veg isn't very big. It's only like 80 to 100 grams, say. So it's on a plate. If you fill up three quarters of your plate with veggies, you, you're going to be hitting three or four servings. So you only need to do that twice a day, and you'll be getting up towards nine or ten servings. Um, and then you know there's lots of there's lots of things everyone knows they should give up, but maybe they can't. And so I another very key piece of advice I give to clients is, you know, what are your big rocks? And by a big rock, I mean something which has a big impact on all other areas of your life. And it, you might not need to remove many big rocks to get a massive benefit. So let's say, let's say you're addicted to chocolate hobnobs and as soon as you open that packet of chocolate hobnobs, you have one, you have two and then the whole packet's gone. I'm not just picking on hobnobs, it could be any biscuit. Um, but then you're going to be you're taking in upward of a thousand calories in terms of simple refined carbs, uh, questionable fats. And so that's going to be putting a massive break on your ability to make body composition progress. Uh, and not often it's a couple of things. So if you give up the hobnobs and start walking 10,000 steps a day, you might find in six months you drop two stone with no other changes. And it, but it may not be something so obvious. It could, or, or it may be something you're addicted to. So I know lots of people have ended up drinking too much in lockdown. You know, they you know, they might have gone out on a weekend, you know, Friday, Saturday in the old days, and now because they're not having to get up and go to work, they're basically having a bit of booze every night. So that might be your big rock that you've got to stop. Uh, or it might be something subtle. So it might be that you like, I've got a cup of tea here, it might be you like, you like your tea, but you have two teaspoons of t sugar in your tea every day and you have four to six cups of tea a day. Now, if you if you then this like bit of self awareness, you start adding up. So that's eight to twelve teaspoons of sugar a day. You got three hundred sixty five days in a year. Well, if you pile all that sugar up next to you, you're standing next to nearly a five kilo bag of sugar at the end of the year. And that's that's a lot. It's the small things that you do cumulatively, either good or bad, that tend to have a a big effect over time. So I think that's a really key thing to to think about. Yeah, no, I mean, I I, I kind of take you know you said I remember some of those things affecting me. I as you know, I, my vice is coffee. I don't drink, but I I was putting sugar in my coffee, and I was like, uh, you know. So you know, you switch habits, don't you? And you switch habits from you know potentially a negative one to a positive one if you believe in the outcome of that change in habit. You know, and that's the yeah. thing. If you believe in it, you'll you'll see that through. And eventually, like now, you know, I don't even kind of think about sugar in my coffee anymore. It's 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 crazy how you know, and it's a bit like the twelve step program with alcohol addiction, isn't it? You've kind of got to you got to replicate the the process and swap something that wasn't doing you any good or was holding you back to something that's going to be um, you know more beneficial. Um, I mean, that's it. all great advice. I mean, if someone wants to kind of uh, get in touch with you and find out more, or, or you know, kind of speak to you more about doing work with you, with yourself, how can, how can they get in touch with you? The the best way is, they can just email me direct. It's it's Matt M A T T at aminoman dot com. So it's the word amino and then the word man dot com. So you can do that. You can. You could do a quick Google search and contact me via Google search uh, as well. So I'm yeah happy to chat to anyone that needs any help. There's there's you know you can you can jump in like you did, Stu, for the full Monty. 
so you know bloods hormones direct personal coaching so that's that's like the full shebang kind of thing but that there's lots of other ways that um are far more affordable as well for you know entry level people that want to have a little dabble have a little sniff around i've i've got an online coaching group which is you know or at the moment on a massive discount so um almost for the price of a couple of lattes per month you can get you can get in there ask questions get the process started lots of people in there who will help you out including myself so you know there's there's ways really to make it achievable to any, for anyone to get um get forward get a bit of coaching from myself yeah and i have to say as well your blog um and your website is is literally one of the best blogs i've ever i've ever seen it's just uh, I mean, God knows how you've managed the time to write it all, but there, there's so many in-depth articles on there on every aspect of health and nutrition and well-being. Um, I'm, you know, the honestly, the the blog posts you've written are, are just phenomenal, and there's so many of them. Um, what 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 website is that again? That your blog's on? That's on aminoman.com. Um, so yeah, again, easy to find, and you're right. That's I mean. Uh, almost a lifetime's work on in the blog section. So I, I really, I'm actually doing a bit like yourself. I'm doing a printable book. So I use the blogs to kind of help me research. So lots of the content which will be in the book is in the blogs, um, rightly or or wrongly. But I think still people are still old fashioned enough to want a an actual printed book in their hand to read. So I don't mind having it up there on the site as well at the moment. Yeah, no, I, you know, the, the, the blog is amazing. I'm sure the book's going to be even more amazing because uh, with you putting it all together, and, and when you put it all together as well, you always add to it, don't you? You know, so yeah. even though you're, you're going to have touched upon subjects on your blog, when you come to make that in the book, you're going to kind of go, oh, okay, I'm going to add this or it's evolved. So, you know, that's the thing with the written word, isn't it? You always kind of, and if you come back to it, you always go, okay, I've learned more, I can add more. So, I'm sure the book's going to be amazing as well. When is there a release date on that yet? Ah, oh, that's a good one. It, it's a bit of a sliding release date, but um, I'm hoping it'll be before Christmas. And what's it? What's it going to be called? Uh, Strength for life. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, uh, definitely one for the for the Christmas list then. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Okay, well, Matt, I, you know, it's been amazing talking to you and uh, you're always an educator and it's the thing is, like, I've learned so much from you and I know, like, you know, friends of both ours, Greg Wooten, you know, he, like I said, I was speaking to him just yesterday and he's raving about, you know, how brilliant you are and obviously, you know, everyone else that you've helped over the years, I'm sure will say equally great things. So, guys... If you're watching, listening, I really do check out Matt. He knows his stuff. I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening to Matt talking about the aspects of weight cutting nutrition today. I'm definitely going to be getting him back on for future episodes and, and talking about other things. We could probably go through all your blog posts, Matt. Just pick a blog post we and do a podcast <laughs> on that blog post. Uh, that, that's, mm. that's, but that, that's how good that, that blog is. Um, but I hope... Uh, Hope everyone's enjoyed this. Thank you, Matt, for, for coming on. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. No, I really appreciate it. And like I said, I look fun. and like you said, I, I look forward to uh, our next stage of the of the the performance evolution. Uh, old man training, I'm gonna call it. Old old man training uh, for the win. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, thanks, Matt. <laughs>